go. So I'm delighted now to introduce our speaker this evening, Alistair Fitter. He's the Emeritus Professor of Ecology at the University of York. He's a Fellow of the Royal Society. He's a plant ecologist with wide ranging interests. He's been appointed a CVE for his work in ecology and he's written numerous popular natural history books um, on, on wide range of subjects. Do people know Blamey Fitter and Fitter? Alistair Fitter is one of the fitters involved in, in producing that book. And he's had a leading role in the International Association of Ecology as well. I also just want to mention that his father was a past president of the London Natural History City. So there's a really nice family connection. And he wrote this book, London's Natural History, one of the first accounts really of the natural history of London. So it's particularly pleasing to have Alistair Fitter here with us this evening. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand you over to Alistair for what I'm sure is going to be a really fascinating talk. Thank you. Right. Uh, let me uh, quickly get bring up my, my talk. Right. Okay. I hope everybody can see that. Yeah, that's Thank fine, you very Alice. much. Thank you very much for the invitation to talk to you. Uh, as Maria said, uh, I have a particular link to the L LNHS, even though I live rather a long way from London. Um, and it's a real pleasure to, to talk to the society. And this talk is absolutely about my father's work. Um, and uh, Everything, what this is all about, the only reason I got into this field was because of his work, and I'll explain all that as I go through. Um, it's a spe very specific take on plants and climate change, because it's about flowering time. I'm not pretending that that's the only impact that, that climate change has on, uh, on plants, but it's a really important one, and it's a very obvious one, and it's one that's incredibly well suited to citizen science work. So I hope that it will inspire you to actually make some measurements and things yourself as well. Um, so that's, it, that's the title, When Will It Flower? And but the, I, I will talk about those plants in a moment, the, 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 uh, the fritillaries that you can see on the slide. Uh, whoa, why is my screen not responding? Oh, it has now, good. Okay, so the idea that plants flower at different times of year is really incredibly well embedded in popular culture. There's no, um, nothing, nothing unusual about it. Everybody knows about it. The idea of a floral clock is widely used. And I've just given you a, an example here. If you go around that clock, you should find things that are in flower in the right month. Uh, if you, if you ad ad adapt a month to an hour, uh, you will find that uh, that works reasonably well. I've rather cheated with December by including gorse, because of course, uh, gorse is in flower throughout the year because as we know kissing is out of fashion when gorse is out of flower so um, uh, there's, there's a bit of a cheat to put gorse in for December but it was the easiest one to, to include so the idea that plants flower at different times of year and they have their characteristic flowering season is extremely well known well embedded and you can get information about flowering time as a diagnostic feature in any plant, plant identification book. It's, 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 it's you know, common sense as it were. Now there's something wrong with my screen because, oh, right, okay. So Shakespeare was very familiar with this. It's, it's, it's embedded in popular culture and Shakespeare was a country boy and he knew all about this. Uh, so here's a, here's a nice quote from Winter's Tale from Perdita, who was actually quite, quite knowledgeable Perdita was. Here's flowers for you, hot lavender, mint, savory, marjoram, the marigold that goes to bed with the sun and with his rises, sweet, rises weeping. These are flowers of middle summer. And that's spot on. Well done, Will. I, that's a, a, an excellent account. And I, I give him full marks at that point. He wasn't always 100% accurate. So the famous speech by Oberon in Midsummer Night's Dream, I know a bank where the wild thyme blows, where oxlips and the nodding violet grows, quite over canopied with luscious woodbine, with sweet musk roses, and with eglantine. Well, yes and no, Will. I mean, I'm not absolutely sure you've got, got it spot on here, because um, these things fly at different times of the year. They, they wouldn't all be in flower together. And, and I think he just needed to do a bit more homework on that speech. Quite a good speech in other ways, but um, botanically slightly lacking. <laughs> 
But the point is that everybody knows this, and it's it's something that is it's embedded in literature, it's embedded in popular culture. It's, it's nothing surprising about it. So let me go back to those fritillaries. These are fritillaries at the bottom of my garden. I could have taken this photograph today. They're in full flower at the moment. I actually took it last year, but uh, uh, it's, it was easy to, to, to use an old photo. Um, and and they, they're doing fantastically. Um, and so you might ask the question, when do they flower? Because that is changing. So let's look at the flowering time of fritillaries taken from uh, books. So let's look, for example, at a series of 19th and early 20th century books as to when uh, these fritillaries flower. And Hooker was quite clear in 1870 that they flowered in May. Drews and Bonnier, and Bonnier is really a translation of a French uh, book, but anyway, Drews and Bonnier um, believe they flowered in May and June. Uh, by the time we get to Bentham and Hooker, they're, they, they're a bit of a cop out. They just say spring, which could mean almost anything, I guess. But I think it's quite clear that up until the middle of the 20th century, it was thought that fritillaries flowered in May and June. And I imagine that means they did. Uh, if you look at the later 20th century, uh, you know, the second half of the 20th century, on the other hand, you get a very different picture. Everybody seems absolutely clear that fritillaries flower in April and May. The only exceptions being the two local floras I've included. So Gillam's flora of Wiltshire, which thinks late April to early May, and the Killick et al. flora of Oxfordshire, which thinks they flower just in April. Um, but there seems to be a pretty clear consensus that by the second half of the 20th century, the fritillaries were flowering about a month earlier than they had been in the previous half century. Now, you have to be taken with a pinch of salt, of course, because it is not unknown for flora and flower book writers to take information from pre-existing books. Uh, and therefore, it doesn't necessarily mean they all of them went out and did their homework. But I can promise you that my father did. Um, so I, I'm reasonably confident that this was true. Uh, in April, in, in the second half of the 20th century, they were flowering in April and May. So when are they flowering now? Well, I can tell you that from my own garden. And the answer is I'll, I'll use last year because last year was a particularly early year. And last year, in my the flotillaries at the bottom of my garden, came into flower on the 11th of March. They were about 10 days later this year because it had been so cold. Um, but they've been flowering every year for the last five or six years in March. So they quite clearly now are March-April flowering. And in fact, by mid-April, they finished. So that's the, the, the flowering time now, mid-March mid to mid-April. And that's a huge change. If you go back, a mere 70 years to the middle of the 20th century, it's a six weeks advance on flowering. So flowering times are changing. They're not fixed in any way. They're changing all the time. And the reason for that is simple, climate's changing. So if we uh, look at the, uh, the, the, the information from the Central England temperature record, we're very fortunate in this country that we have the best temperature data in the world and we can, we can do temperatures back to the 17th century pretty accurately from a whole range of different sources. But if you look at this graph, this shows the, the difference in the annual mean temperature in central England from the period 1961 to 1990, uh, which is taken as a sort of, you know, standard period. And you can see that, I, uh, that in that period, 1961 to 1990, around here, uh, it is, of course, around zero because the difference from that period was going to be zero. Back here, before that, the average, and this is the running average, this red line, is almost always below that, that value. In other words, the years were colder. There were occasional warm years, but many more cold years. Whereas in the last 20 years or 30 years, virtually all the summers, all the years are changing we know it's changing here's the evidence and it's not perhaps surprising that plants are responding to it oh dear uh, 
Um, I've got a message on my screen saying my internet connection is unstable. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Back yes. Again, so don't worry. It's okay. Okay, fine. Good. Sorry, apologies for that. Alistair, right. just to warn you, if yeah. that keeps popping up, what it might be worth doing is turning your video off because that, that will save a bit of bandwidth on your computer. Um, uh, if you've got Dropbox okay. or anything like that on it, it's worth turning it off as well. well if, if, if anything goes wrong, tell me and I'll then stop my, uh, my video. Will okay. do. Uh, so I, I've skipped a slide. So, um, so we know, we know that flowering time, flower, flowering time is getting earlier. And one of the best ways of telling this is from a, a fantastic uh, citizen science project run by the Woodland Trust called Nature's Calendar, where you can just go onto a website and, and say when you saw something coming into flower. And from that, there's an enormous amount of data. That, uh, they, and I've just given some data. The last time I looked at it, the, the, uh, the data were there up to 2016. They may have updated it recently, I don't know. But so this is um, the first flowering date. So the, what everybody records, because it's incredibly easy to do, is first flowering date, the first day on which you see something, some particular plant species come into flower. Now, there's a lots of problems with first flowering date because sometimes something comes into you know, single plant flowers and then nothing else happens for three weeks and so on. But even so, it has a great merit, but it's unequivocal. Either you did see it in flower or you didn't. You know, and if you try and do much more sus subtle things like the period of peak flowering or something, you've got to make a judgment when that is and so on. So it's much easier to stick to first flowering date. And that's, I'll use that throughout this talk and it's FFD is the abbreviation for it. So here are some examples from the Woodland Trust uh, Nature's Calendar website. And you can see that in this rather short period of 15 years between 2001 and 2016, hazel advanced its flowering by 31 days, a whole month. That's you know, a pretty dramatic change. And indeed, one regularly sees hazel in flower in December, well before Christmas these days. That's a celandine by 27 days, nearly a month, and bluebell by 21 days. I want you to remember lesser celandine, 27 days advance in flowering time in 15 years, two days a year, between 2001 and 2016. So just remember that one. So we have these sorts of data. But actually, we have much more than that. And the reason we have much more than that is thanks to my father, who was uh, a, a very fine naturalist. Uh, and I'm, you know, you've, you've already been had, had one of his books waved in front of you. Well, he, um, he was indeed president of LNHS. He was a member of LNHS for 70 years. Uh, he held many roles in the society. He was the editor of the London Naturalist. He was the co-editor of the Bird Report. He was the on secretary, then the chairman of the mammal, reptile, amphibian section, uh, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, uh, of the bird section. He was then recorder for mammals, reptiles, and amphibians. And perhaps most importantly of all, he wrote the book, London's Natural History, which was one of the first new naturalists. And probably, I mean, it was the first account of an urban natural history anywhere. Nobody had thought really before that cities merited that sort of a treatment. And, now, uh, by doing that, I think he stimulated an enormous interest in London's natural history, but also in urban natural history. Now, urban ecology now is a huge field of, of, of study, but it didn't exist before that. And though he was no academic, uh, he, 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 um, he actually took a, 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 an economics degree uh, at the LSE back in the uh, 30s, but uh, he, um, he, he made his living by writing books throughout his life. Um, and he wrote huge numbers of, of, of very, very well used uh, uh, field guides and other natural history and conservation books. He was a very influential figure, but one of the things he did was make lists of things he saw in, in the natural world, make notes. And he made ex extensive notes on many aspects of natural history, including flowering times. So he noted down from in fact, he started this in the 1930s, he noted down the first flowering dates of plants. And, and he moved out of London at the end of the war uh, to Burford in the Cotswolds. And then in 1953, he moved to the, uh, to the Chilterns. And from 1953 to 2000, when he moved house uh, away, away from that house, he kept detailed notes of first flowering dates 
for over 600 species of plants. And when he had to uh, leave that, that house and the, the record stopped, we, he and I together analyzed that enormous 50 years worth nearly of flowering times for hundreds and hundreds of species of plants and came up with some rather remarkable findings. So this is a brief summary of the paper that we wrote together and was published in this journal Science, which is one of the leading science journals in the world. Um, and it, it caused a lot of interest because actually at the time, this was the, the single largest study on the impact of climate change on the natural world. And it, uh, it, it created interest because of that. And of course, also because it was written by a father and son team and the, fa the, the father, the senior author, was 90, um, very nearly, he was 89 to be precise. Uh, and that piqued people's curiosity. And in fact, we were interviewed together on the PM program, the only time I've ever been on the PM program. Uh, it was entirely thanks to him. And he was asked by Eddie Mayer why he'd made these records. And he simply said that when he was a young lad, somebody had told him it was a good idea to make notes about things. And so he'd done so ever since. And thank God he did, because the result was an astonishing set of data. So this slide summarizes this enormous amount of data. And what it shows you is, it's quite complicated, but along this here, you have the deviation of first flowering date of the, the period 91 to 2000 compared to the previous 30 odd years. So if it's zero, that means the flowering date, the first flowering date in the 1990s was the same as previously. If it's positive, it means it was flowering later than previously. And if it's negative, it means it was flowering earlier than previously. And this is the number, they're all done in three day blocks to make it easier to interpret. This is the number of species. You can see there's huge numbers of species involved. And you can see that most species flowered earlier. The, the commonest timing is about six days earlier. Um, uh, the gray columns mean me merely that there was something happening. If it's black, it was sig statistically significant, and quite a lot of them are. Uh, overall, except for any individual species, most of them aren't actually significant, but the, the sheer scale of it means the whole pattern is. Most species flowered earlier in the 1990s than they had been before. And a few species, that's really interesting, and we'll come back to that, flowered later in the 1990s than they used to do. So these are my father's data, um, and to give them some sort of flesh, I'll give you the extreme advance, which was white dead nettle, lamium album, which in the 1990s was flowering 55 days earlier than it had been in the previous 30 odd years. In fact, what had happened was it had started to flower all year round, and you can now find uh, white dead nettle in flower in any month of the year, but that never used to be true. If you go back to old floras, it says it flowers in April or May, but now it flowers often in December. I mean, you can find it flowering literally any time of the year you want. And then at the other extreme, uh, we have uh, Buglia. Um, I, 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 uh, I'm just gonna minimize the, the that. Again, I, I couldn't see the bit of, that bit of the screen. Um, we have Buglia, which was flowering 36 days later. And that's an extraordinary change to why on earth would budly a flower 36 days later it, because the climate had got warmer? And actually the answer is we still don't know. It's an interesting phenomenon, but it remains un uncertain what, the, what the, cause it, the causation of that is. Now, here are some more examples. Uh, here's ivy leaf toad flax, which uh, was flowering in the 1990s at the 15th of April on average, prior, prior to that 11th of March, 35 days earlier. That's a huge change. That's five weeks change in one decade. And here we have greater stitch work 25 days earlier. Oops, see, I've gone too far. But well, here, I want to ask you to remember lesser celandine. If you remember, lesser celandine had advanced by nearly a month in the period 2001 to 2016. Well, in the previous decade, it had already advanced by 20 days, by three weeks. So in the space of 25 years, lesser celandine flower, average first flowering date had advanced by something like seven weeks. 
which is an astonishing rate of change. Um, I mean, quite extraordinary. Um, and obviously not something that can be sustained unless everything is going to flower all year round. There must be a change to that. Interestingly enough, it's not just wild plants. Everything my father looked at is wild plants. I quite often give a talk similar to this to gardening groups. And so I always throw in this slide as well, because a guy called Fred Last, who was a professor at Edinburgh, uh, studied the plants in his garden exactly the same way um, over a 30 or so year period. Um, and he found exactly the same thing, that there were uh, plants that flowered much earlier, uh, and Mahonia was one, and there were plants, which is actually a perfectly good wild plant, of course, but much commoner in gardens, which were planting, flowering later. And Mazerian, in his study, though I don't think that's general, because uh, it's been in flower in my garden for quite a while now, um, was flowering later in, the, in, in 2007 than it had been in 1978. So it's true of, of, of wild plants, and it's true also of garden plants. So this led me to, be, to ask the interesting question, when do plants actually, you know, what is the overall pattern of plant flowering time? I said at the beginning, you can, we can think of the floral clock, uh, different plants coming into flower at different times of year, but what is the, the typical figure? Well, it, here we are, this is, so the red line here represents my father's data, Oxfordshire, 1952 to 2000. The green line represents data taken from floras. And, and what I did was I, I simply worked out what was the date, and I did it in, in I think it was 10 day periods, um, or might even be, might have been for the flora, because they only give months, it was month periods. So I worked out what's the number of plant species which are said to be in flower by the 1st of February, uh, by the 1st of March, by the 1st of April, by the 1st of May, and so on and so forth. And I just totaled those so that you can come up with this rather simple statistic and ask, what is the date by which you expect half the plants in the flora to have come into flower? And if you take flora data from, from books, the answer is about the middle of June. And if you take the data from my father's records, the answer is very end of May. So by end of May, mid middle of June, half the plants in the entire flora come, have, have come into flower. And that seems quite a nice and intuitively sensible. It sounds about right. I mean, it doesn't surprise me that that should be so. So then I thought, I wonder what's happening now. So I started doing what I should have done a long time before. I started collecting data on flowering times from my own garden. I, I, I was able to do that because I'm, as I'm a plant nut. So it turned out I've got uh, about 1,200 species of plants in my garden. So it was made a quite a good sample. So I looked, I, 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 for 2017, I did a very careful count of when things were coming into flower. And the astonishing thing I found was, and bear in mind, York is 200 miles north of Oxfordshire. So you'd have expected things to come into flower later, far from it, by the end of April, half the plants in my garden were in flower. So it looks as though flowering time across the entire flora has advanced by about a month. And then I had a horrible thought. I thought, ah, well, a lot of these are garden plants. I wonder if I be a lazy gardener, whether I plant a lot of things like spring bulbs, perhaps, and maybe, maybe a very high proportion of the plants in my garden are just early flowering plants. So, is the difference because it's garden plants? Well, fortunately, I had uh, several hundred species of native plants in my garden, so I can do exactly the same calculation for native plants only. And whether you look at all plants or the native plants makes no difference. The native plants, if anything, are coming into flower fractionally earlier. So by the middle of April, half the native plants in my garden are in flower. In other words, just consistent with everything else, since the data my father collected from the 1990s largely, when flowering times, you know, the, the advance to then, if I compare that with what's happening now in York, flowering times have advanced by five weeks or so. And probably 
It's more than that if you compared a similar geographical location. So there's no question flowering times have advanced hugely. The pattern for different species is quite different. So these, again, this is my father's data again. Here's a spurge laurel. And you can see that spurge laurel has basically gone progressively earlier throughout this 50 year period. It goes up and down a bit, there are earlier years and later years, but there's a pretty clear pattern that they're getting earlier and earlier and earlier. On the other hand, I believe toad flax, which is one of the things which advanced dramatically, only did that in the 1990s. It did nothing at all in the previous 50, 30 odd years. <laughs> and then all of a sudden in the 1990s, bang, it decided to flower earlier. And then you've got uh, great stitchwort, which just only responds to particularly warm springs, though it did show a response in the 1990s. And then there was an amazingly warm spring in 1996 when it was flowered ridiculously early. Came into flower at the end of January, when typically it was coming into flower in the middle of March. So different species are responding in quite different ways. And of course, some plants flower later. So there's that mysterious buddleia flowering 36 days later. And there's another example from the East Lothian garden data set, Persicaria vaccinia folia, uh, delayed by four days per year, which is the, a, a huge difference. And, and as I say, we are left actually unsure of what the mechanism is for these. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So we have plants flowering earlier, most, most plants flowering earlier, but with curiously different uh, patterns of, of response. And then we have some plants, a much smaller number, actually flowering later. So we might ask the question, okay then, so what determines flowering time? What, what, you know, what is causing all this? And there are a number of things. So one is, is development. So when are the flower buds initiated? Because if the plant doesn't have flower buds, it can't flower. So the, fl the flowering time may depend upon that. And indeed, that's very obvious with bulbs, for example. So uh, summer flowering bulbs are making their flowering buds now. So they can't flower dramatically early because they haven't got any flowering buds. Whereas the winter and spring flowering bulbs, things like Narcissus and Calanthus and Crocus and Tulips and so on, they produce their, their um, flowering buds before they go into dormancy the previous year. The bulb that you buy from the garden center in January or whenever has got its flowering buds ready formed. So if they get the right conditions, they can just come straight in the flower, ping, just like that. And there's a lovely example of that being true here with tulips. Now, I don't know whether you're familiar with the, the, the tulip societies. There used to be many tulip societies. Uh, I'm sure there were some in London. The only one well, I think that's surviving is the Wakefield and North of England. It's now, now all of it. It used to just be Wakefield. The Wakefield and North of England Tulip Society, which has been going since 1836. <clears throat> and they specialize in what are called broken tulips. I mean, they're interested in all forms of tulips, but this is sort of a residue of the great Dutch tulip craze, I suppose. And they do an annual show. And until 2011, the show date was determined by when tulips were at their best. So they didn't want to have the show when none of the tulips were in flower or when they'd all gone over. So they would ring around, or I suppose in, uh, in, in before they were ringing around, maybe they were sending pigeons with the information, I don't know, anyway, but they, they, they checked with each other when, you know, how things were doing, and then they would give two weeks notice. When they could sell, the tulips were coming into bud nicely, they would give two weeks notice, and they would have a show. And this is the show dates from 1827 to 2011. And you can see that actually throughout the 20, 19th century, pretty steady. Uh, they tended to ha hold the show in late May, though some years it was incredibly late and some years it was a bit earlier. But then progressively during the 20th century, the shows got earlier and earlier and earlier, with one or two really bizarrely early years, wonderful early springs, no doubt. And if you then, instead of plotting that against date, you plot the show date as a function of mean March temperature, you can see it's a pretty good relationship. They, the show date gets three days earlier for every degree warmer than March is. 
So they could have, if they were able to predict March temperature, they could have predicted when to have their shows. I think it's a lovely example of, uh, of the impact of flowering time, of, of temperature of flowering time. So development matters. Uh, move on. Another thing that matters hugely is photo period. Though actually we know surprisingly little, everybody knows that photo period determines flowering time, that there are long day plants, which actually should be called shortening night plants. And there are short day plants, which actually should be called lengthening night plants, because that's what the plants are measuring. They're measuring the length of the night and whether it's getting longer or shorter. And they do that by an incredibly clever piece of, 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 uh, of biochemistry. Physiology, they have a, a really wonderful uh, uh, hormone which is um, able to switch between states and is sensitive to the uh, far red light that you get at, at sunset. Um, now, some plants are day neutral and will flower irrespective of day length. Some are long day, some are short day, but actually, for the vast majority of plants, we simply don't know how they respond. We make assumptions because if plants fly in the autumn, we think, oh, they obviously they must be short uh, short day plants, and if they plant and they fly in, in early summer, we think, oh, they must be long long day plants. But actually, experimental work has been restricted to an extraordinarily small number of species. So that's another important control on flowering time, and of course temperature. Now the data set I've shown you, which are the Woodland Trust, uh, Nature's Calendar, and my father's data, uh, are, are both important data sets. The longest data set, however, uh, comes from a family called the Marsham family in Norfolk, who up until the late 40s, from the 18th century, recorded a whole series of phenological events. And what they, they call it the front, like frog sport and first chiff chap and all sorts of things, but quite a few flowering times as well. And one of the things they recorded was Coltsfoot. And a guy called Tim Sparks has analyzed their data. Um, and he showed uh, how incredibly uh, precise the, uh, the relationship between the flowering time of Coltsfoot and the February temperature. So CET is the Central England temperature record again. Uh, and you can see that if that's very cold, if you're really freezing temperature February, you don't get cold sweat flying till April. But if you have a lovely mild February, you can get cold sweat flying in February. So uh, not quite sure how it works with something flying this early. Obviously, January must have been important for those two. Um, in fact, it can't be just as simple as February temperature, because if you look uh, uh, in my garden in 2016, I had Coltsfoot in flower in December, so that clearly wasn't responding to February temperature. It must have been responding, I don't know, to perhaps to November temperature. No, I, nobody knows. I mean, clearly there are other things at work than just a single month's temperature. But these sorts of data show that temperature is hugely important and very crudely put across a huge number of species. You can say that a single degree centigrade of warming in a critical month tends to advance flowering in a very wide range of species by around five days. But there's a huge difference, it turns out, between warm springs and warm autumns. So spring flowering species, you get this uh, um, big effect of uh, warming in the, the months just before flowering. So any single month up to about four months before flowering will advance on average about three and a half days. Uh, if, if you find a sing, the single best month, it can be as much as five, but typically about three and a half days. So that's a pretty clear cut and fairly obvious result. But how about this one? Warm summers or autumns, in other words, a period perhaps six to eight months before uh, flower, first flowering date, delay flowering spring by about the same amount. And here are examples of species which uh, that's true of. Now, when I talk about this to, to plant physiologists and others, they say, oh, it's verbalization, it's well-known phenomenon. But it's not just that, because it applies to a wide range of species. It applies, for example, to annuals, such as ivy leaf speedwell. It applies to herbaceous perennials, such as green hellebore. And it applies to trees and shrubs such as blackthorn. So it can't be something as simple as vernalization. And in truth, we don't know 
what causes this rather remarkable effect. And a, a lot more work is needed on it to find out. Because it, it's, well, it results in very unpredictable effects. So there's no question that, that temperature is having, that climate change is having a huge impact on flowering time. But you might ask the question, does it matter? And the answer is, because you know, if everything was getting flowering earlier, you'd just get an earlier spring, and that would be it. You know, nothing. But actually, it does matter for two reasons. One is, well, for several reasons. One is that there is this difference with some things flowering earlier and some things flowering later. Uh, but there are also other specific cases. For example, pollinators may well be disrupted from the, from the, the, the things they pollinate. And where there are specific pollinators, and here, here's a classic example, uh, fly orchid, sorry, I spelt the uh, scientific name wrong there, um, which has a, a specific wasp that pollinates it. If they respond differently to climate change, then they will not meet up. Um, both the pollinator and the, the pollinatee uh, will suffer. Also, for example, seed feeders. So orange tip butterflies feed on the developing seeds of a few cruciferous, notably uh, Cardamine pretensis. So uh, you can look at that too. So fortunately, my father also me me measured the first emergence date of butterflies. So I have his own his data for orange ship butterflies as well. Now, fortunately for both cuckoo flower, uh, Cardamine pretensis, and orange ship butterfly, Anthocaris cardamines, it turns out they respond pretty similarly. So if you look at the first flowering date of the, of the plant and the first emergence date of the butterfly, they are pretty well correlated. In the years when the, the plants flower late, the butterflies emerge late. So uh, they, for, fortunately for them, they're both responding in the same way, but that does not need to be the same. And indeed there are cases where that's not the same. And if the, if the seed feeder and the, and, the, and the plant get out of kilter, the seed feeder is gonna be in trouble. Another consequence of these changes, because the impacts on species are so idiosyncratic, some responding dramatically, some advancing, some retarding, and so on, it will change the probability of hybridization. So in some species, hybridization is going to be less likely. Uh, in some species, it's going to be more likely. Some species are going to fly further apart than they used to. Some species are going to fly closer together. Now, hybridization is one of the major drivers of evolution. So if hybridization is less likely in some groups, you're going to get less evolutionary change. If hybridization is more likely in other groups, you may get more evolutionary change. You may not see those effects for quite a long time, but it's a potentially a huge impact of, of these changes in flowering time. So yes, flowering time is not just a curiosity. Uh, it does matter. It is likely to change the way in the world, the way the world looks and, and operates. And it may lead, lead to the disappearance of species. It may lead to new species appearing uh, as the normal parts of our fauna and flora. We don't know. All we can say is that flowering time is a really clear harbinger. It tells us probably what the simplest and easiest indicator the most visible and most obvious indicator that climate is changing and is having a huge impact on the natural world. It's not likely to be the big impact. I mean, the biggest impact on, on the natural world is gonna be in other things, the changes in distributions, failure to set seed in plants, failure to breed in animals, invasions by new species, extinctions of species which can't cope with hot summers, and so on and so forth. The world, we, we can already see big changes because of climate. The important thing about flowering time is we can measure it incredibly easily. And it's something that everybody, every naturalist can do very easily. And I would urge you to take part in the citizen science projects which, take, which are taking place which generate really, really important data. I mean, the fact that my father did that for 50 years uh, enabled us to make a statement about flowering time and about climate change and its impacts on the natural world at a critical moment. And we owe him and people like him a huge debt for that reason. So please 
Get, take part, measure flowering times, make notes. Data are hugely important. But I'll finish with Shakespeare. So uh, it, it could be it, it is climate change, but Titania didn't think so. She thought it was Oberon's fault. Uh, through this this temperature, do we see the seasons alter? Hoary headed frosts fall in the fresh lap of the crimson rose, and on old Heme's thin and icy crown, an odorous chapters of sweet summer buds is as in mockery set. The spring, the summer, the childy autumn, angry winter change their wanted liveries, and the mazed world by their increase now knows not which is which. Fair summary, I think. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that, Alistair. That was a really interesting talk with lots of food for thought and very clearly flowering time as a clear indicator of the changing of the impact of changing climate. I like the way we started and ended with Shakespeare. I thought that was particularly nicely put together and it was just lovely to hear the account of yours and your father's work. And I would again like to pay tribute to all his, you know, his long-standing connection and all that he did for the LNHS. And I would recommend that his book on the London Natural History, second-hand copies of that are available. And it's just a really fascinating read. So I would recommend that. And, your, you know, your, your talk has really highlighted the value of those kind of data sets and the, of citizen science. We've got a lot of um, questions already coming through in the chat. So if, if, you, if you're okay with that, we're going to yep. turn yep. to that yep. straight away. Is that, is that all right? Yeah, um, of course. Yep. And, and if you, if, yeah, people like to put their videos back on. Um, you can. If somebody would like to ask a question in person, um, do pop your sort of virtual hand up and we'll see if we can fit in a couple of live questions. And Anchor, if I can go over to you now and you can pick out, um, a, just a, I don't think we'll get through all the questions, but if we could pick out a few from the chat, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to, I'm going to start with some of the single questions because there are also kind of groups of questions um, that we might be able to tackle in a second. Um, and I know that with this first question from Mike Ashworth, you actually kind of touched on it but maybe you could add a little bit more to it. So Mike was asking, most of these flowers are insect pollinated. So are the insects emerging earlier as well? Uh, and, and the answer is some of them are and some of them aren't. And that, that is a potential cause of disruption to ecosystems, yeah. Uh, and the answer is also that we don't really necessarily have very good data uh, on quite a lot of those. But for some groups we do. Uh, there are very active groups recording you know, things like Hymenoptera and Lepidoptera and so on and so forth. But other pollinators, we don't actually have fantastically good data on. Um, so, uh, it's all, I mean, the more, these sorts of data are so, so important. And, and the amount, the, the, the probability that they're going to be gathered by professional scientists uh, who, uh, who are not likely to be funded to do this sort of thing is very, very low. So the role of the citizen scientist in this is enormously important. Um, so I would, you know, I'd just reiterate, please, please go out and record things. It's so, so valuable. But the answer to the question is, yes, some insects are showing big responses and others are not. And that's, you know, that can lead to quite large disruption. Yeah. And I would like to reiterate that um, if people are interested in recording, we have the LNHS um, iRecord um, set up. So you can always join in and record anything you see, plants, animals, um, anything would be really useful. Um, now we have a kind of a longish question from Carolyn and she's asking, um, she's asked, could the later blooming be due to genetics, more degree days needed to protect against a late frost? Um, and she kind of goes on to say that her master's thesis on leaf emergence found that the same plant from the Southern states, so she's from the US, um, from the southern states or lower elevation emerged later when grown in a common garden than those from northern, a northern state or higher altitude. So could flowers behave the same way? Um, so she's kind of given an example, um, peaches growing in the southernmost state, if they came out earlier, they could be frozen by a late frost. Um, so all those that bloomed earlier and were killed by the frost didn't produce seeds or reproduce. Yeah, the, 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 the existence of that, what would be called ecotypic differentiation in populations like that is very well established. And uh, particularly, in, in fact, from uh, the US, because uh, there are a lot of 
plant species, which because the mountains and ranges in the US go north south, a lot of species which go up and down, as it were, for, for big geographical ranges, uh, much more so than in Europe. Uh, so there's been a lot of work, particularly in the US and, and Canada, on that sort of geographic differentiation in population. So yes, it's absolutely true. If you take northern and southern species and plant them together in a common garden, they will behave quite differently. They respond to day length differently. Uh, they respond to temperature differently. They may well have different sensitivities to, to temperature. I don't think that's what's causing the differences we're seeing because what's happening here is the, the climate is moving, not the plants, as it were. Uh, but, but obviously, as the climate moves, there is likely to be huge selection pressure on populations which will result in evolutionary change because um, if, if you you know if, if you don't if you if, if it's advantageous to leaf out early then an early leafing out uh, um, or an early flowering uh, genotype is going to be at an advantage and will and will spread through the population um, and particularly in, in relatively sh short-lived plants with short generation times we should we, we probably will start seeing that you know we probably are seeing that already it's just that nobody's measuring it um, but yes, I think it's, I mean, there will be genetic changes going on, no question. Um, can I just um, say, if there's anybody who wants to ask a question in person, please uh, um, do kind of let me see the virtual hand and then I can pick that up. George, I can see you've unmuted yourself. Is that because you wanted to ask a question? No, George, I was messing around. My video is not working and I can't turn it on. Oh, right. Apparently, okay. Well, you, apparently you, because you, the host has turned me off. Ah, oh, yes. All right. <laughs> okay, but did, okay. okay. So you don't, you don't, would you like to ask, ask anything, no. Alistair, anything or? No, I have no questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, then we've got more here. Um, so um, kind of talking a little bit, this is again related to climate. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more of this, unfortunately. But Liz Andrew was asking if a summer and autumn um, if they're too dry, it might be more difficult for plants to produce the buds for the next year. So they appear later. So I think. Was... I, I think the, the autumn temperature effect may well be connected with moisture. I think that's really quite likely uh, because it's quite hard to come up with a mechanism uh, which. But on the other hand, if it's that, it's quite hard to explain why annuals would be affected uh, because. You know, they're by them, they're, they're seeds. So, uh, you know, um, ivy leaf speedwell, for example, which is one of the species that flowers later after a, after a, after a, a warm sort of summer autumn, um, by that time of the year is seeds. It sets seeds. It sets seeds in you know, about, about now. In fact, it's already full flower and starting to set seeds. So uh, it's, it's, it's a classic winter annual, starts, starts to grow. Um, in, in, in the winter and, and, and flowers in the spring. So it's very hard to see how that will go. So I, I think as with all these things, the explanation will be complex. And the problem is that these are not topics which receive serious uh, research attention. So we actually don't know what the answer is. We, we you know, for, for things like the control of flowering, we know absolutely what determines it in a very small number of species. Um, crop species and a few model species which are used by plant geneticists and they've worked it out in fine detail and what they know is the mechanisms but of course the, the mechanisms are very well but what we need to know for to understand how the natural world is going to respond is how different plants operate those mechanisms what are the triggers that they use i mean knowing that they have a gene system which which induces flowering and so is great but it doesn't tell you what it's actually going to do in that particular species unless you understand how, the, how that is triggered. So that's the problem is we can't, we simply can't make predictions. All you can do is measure it and try and find out. You have to be empirical. You can't predict, which is why we need data. <laughs> Always need data. So um, we've probably got time for maybe one or two last um, questions, Anka, if you just want to pick a couple last two things out. Okay, yeah, there's one, because um, there were quite a few questions about the data, um, particularly regarding, you know, when fl uh, your, the plants um, are actually flowering. And um, so I think this one kind of encompasses it quite well. Angela Richard, uh, Richmond Fuller has asked what variables were taken into consideration for um, your data, for your um, graphs? You mean what climate variables? 
I think maybe just whatever you, any variables that you took into consideration for the flowering um, graphs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the basic variable was first flowering date. So that, that was, the, the, that was the, the, the dependent variable we were trying to explain. And then we looked at a whole series of different, um, I'd have to go back to the original analyses and work out to remember all they were. But we looked at the temperatures of, the mean temperatures of every month virtually. We looked at the whole, we looked at other uh, climatic variables too. We also looked at a whole series of things like the position of the North Atlantic oscillation and all sorts of weird things like that. Um, but in the end, it was always best explained by the mean temperature of a month, usually one or two months before flowering date. And it looks as though many, many plants are incredibly um, sensitive to that and will, will respond to that. And that, that shouldn't be surprising. I mean, it isn't surprising. I mean, every gardener knows that, you know, that uh, when you get a warm spell, things come into flower and things stop flowering, you know, they go over and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's common sense, as it were. I think what was surprising was how consistent and universal the responses were on the one hand, you know, you could, you could get this huge effect of a huge range of species, and then how idiosyncratic it was on the other hand. So that though across all species, you could see this dramatic effect. Actually, some species were responding in, in, in their own unique way, uh, making it very hard to say that though you can say for, for plants in general, yeah, they're all going to flower earlier, um, but, or, you know, there's going to be a pretty strong trend to that. If you say, I wonder what that particular species will do, the answer is you've got to go and measure it. We don't know. Um, Anka, do we have one very last quick question to finish off? Yeah. <laughs> and I think this one might be a good one for a lot of people, especially who um, are just beginning with um, botany. Um, so Martin Butt has asked, um, at what point do you decide a bud is in flower? Ah, that's, uh, that, that, yeah, uh, my father's rule was very simple. Can you see either anthers or stigmas? So if you can see them without poking away and so on and so forth, you know, if they're visible, it's in flower. Um, and sometimes that's very frustrating because you, you, you find this plant and, and, uh, it's, and, it's, and you're not, you're not going to see it again for a week. For, for whatever reason, and it's not quite showing anthers. You know, it's almost it's everything ready to go, and it's not. And you, and you come back a week later, and it's in full cloud. You don't know whether it was next day or six days later, or but that's that's the rule. Can you see anthers or or stigmas? Thank you. That's a nice, clear sort of clear cut cut explanation to finish off with. I can imagine it must be extremely tempting not to maybe kind of just to sort of peel the edges of the petals just to see. But yeah, no, that's that's really helpful. And it's it's sort of like it sounds like a you know somebody might think that's a silly question to ask, but actually it's a really useful right. question really because important it's the sort question. of thing that you need to know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, really, really great. So thank you very much. I thought that was just so inspiring. I hope it's encouraged everybody to kind of go out and to start looking for first flowering themselves, you know, around where that where they live and to be making sure that they're collecting that data because look at the value of a kind of data set like, like your father's. That's sort of 50 year on a, in a particular place and that's level of detail. That's kind of, like, that's irreplaceable. It's, it's data that's just so valuable. Mm -hmm. So I hope that this inspired everybody else to, to and, and also I think what your talk brought out is all the unknowns, the very vari the variability that you can't make kind of like assumptions that every species is going to behave in the same sort of way, the very different patterns, and the fact that there's there's things we don't understand yet, and that you know all everybody, citizen scientists, can all kind of contribute to the de the development, the progress of scientific knowledge. So please, you know, I, I certainly personally found that extremely inspiring. So thank you once more, and we've had a lot.